Okay, uh, let's turn over to Psalms 23. Um, mine says 859. So, just a minute. Hope everyone had a good morning this morning. Without panic, coming up on the interstate from from uh, uh, 17, I saw the sign that said ramp closed, and that's all I saw. Apparently, it was a different time because if the ramp was closed, I wouldn't be here yet. I'll be late. <laughs> you never know. I hate it when they do that. We have to double back, go all the way back to landing to get up on the interstate to that. So. Oh. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and have a prayer. We begin. Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful morning you blessed us with. We pray your, your uh, blessings on our study today, Lord. Help us, Father, to uh, read your word and understand it. Father, help speak to us, Lord, this morning as we, as we look at it, Father. We pray that you'd open our hearts and our, and our minds Father, we pray also as we go forth from here into uh, our worship service that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with uh, Mike as he brings us the lesson of the hour, and I pray that you would speak through him, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, we are going to look at a psalm that is probably the most, not only the most popular psalm, probably the most popular chapter in the Bible or most read. You can guess what I'm going to say right now. What, 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 what psalm are we studying? 23, that's exactly right. Now, most of the time, uh, we think of this as a psalm that's read where? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we think of this as a psalm that's read at funerals. Um, unfortunate. This is unfortunate. I mean, not that we shouldn't read it at funerals. I mean, I wouldn't mind if this was read at my funeral. That's fine. Um, it's a beautiful psalm, and it is appropriate at funerals, but it's also not just a funeral psalm. It's a psalm for us today. Uh, it's a psalm for the living. Um, and as we, we read this, um, I'd like for us to think of it in a different perspective. It's actually a challenging psalm. When I say challenging, I mean it's something that challenges our thinking and challenges the way we live. It challenges our life. Um, think of, hang, hang on just a second. Let me get a song book out of here because there's a couple of songs that come to mind when we do this. Just a moment. Normally we have one in here, but guess what? There's not there anymore. Okay. So I'm just going to have to remember it. Um, <laughs> Um, I meant to bring one, but I thought, well, I'll just get one out of the cabinet next to the thing. But no, they're not there anymore. Um, let's think of a song. This is a song that comes to my mind. Uh, you ever, we know the song, I Surrender All. I Sur Can you sing that song? Yeah, we can sing that song. But, uh, I mean, that's a challenging song to sing, isn't it? Right. And really mean it, really. You know, haven't we, have we all surrendered all? All the time? No. Yeah, it's supposed to, right, exactly. But that's a challenge. What about the song He Leadeth Me? Oh, I love that song. So wonder he oh he leadeth me. Oh oh how does it go? Oh blessed thought. You know, he leadeth me. We 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 think of those that song is like, well really, does he lead me? Does he lead me all the time? You know, everywhere I go, everything I do. It's up to you. Exactly. <laughs> it's challenging, isn't it? When you think about it, you know, otherwise, if you don't think about the words, you just, oh, that's beautiful. It's just kind of like poetry. Well, this song is kind of like that. It's, you can just read and say, oh, that's a beautiful song. Or you can think about, how does this apply to my life? And that's what we're going to try to look at it today and see. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to read it through first, and then we'll kind of go step by step through it as we do. And I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Now, by the way, the first, ver the first edition of the NIV came out read a little differently than this. And I kind of liked it. Um, they went ahead and changed it back because everyone was used to hearing it a certain way. And they, they went ahead and 
changed it back to the way everyone was used to hearing it read, okay? I'm going to read it both ways. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want, okay? Um, the the, the uh, original NIV said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. And that's really what it means. That's what it, the, we don't use the term want much more except for, you know, I want this or I want that, you know. Uh, want had a different meaning in earlier days. It meant you lacked for something. You know, if someone was in want, they were hungry because they didn't have food or they, didn't, they were in want because they didn't have shelter or they didn't have, that was being in want. Um, and so they, uh, everyone was so used to hearing it that way that they just put it back in. <laughs> so now we, we need to understand the meaning. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, does any of your translations say, surely goodness and mercy? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a better translation of that, uh, goodness and mercy. It, it's, it, and I'm, I'm going to give the translators a break because that Hebrew word is a hard word. I'm not an expert in Hebrew, but uh, that particular word, my, my, uh, one of my teachers at, 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 at uh, Amridge, who is a Hebrew scholar, talked about that word in one of his discussions, and he says it's very hard to translate. Um, if you have that American standard, it'll say loving kindness. Um, mercy is, is uh, a common translation of that, and I think that's a better one. But in any event, um, so let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning here. Um, this passage, this, this, this chapter, this psalm, is a challenge for us to have a personal relationship with God. That's what it is. Um, just like those other songs that I read, can you read this and mean it? Can you speak it yourself? I mean, anybody can read it, but can it be words from your own mouth, from your own heart? Can you mean it and say it as if you're writing it yourself um, and, and making a declaration, the Lord is my shepherd? Um, and that's what the psalmist is doing here. He's saying, uh, and he uses the proper noun uh, for, for Lord. Uh, notice this capitalized, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall lack uh, nothing or I shall not be in want. Um, and then he uses the, the, uh, the shepherd and the sheep metaphor. Now, we have talked about this in sermons and recently, and, and I, don't want to I don't want to belabor that too much. But I, I've got to mention it because it's the, it's the shepherd's psalm, it's called. It's, it uses that metaphor. Uh, a sheep, the Lord is my shepherd. David is tacitly or implicitly saying that he is a sheep. And that's a, an amazing thought. Because David, if you looked at his life, you would say he was anything but a sheep. You know, sheep are docile and, 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 and vulnerable and, and they are uh, needy. And they are, uh, I mean, anything, they are, they're just very un-David-like, which you think when you think of David, okay? David is the warrior that defeated Goliath. He is the one that killed the lion and the bear. He's the one that Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands, you know? I mean, you see all that. You don't think of David as a sheep, but David is saying he's a sheep. Now, if you really look a little deeper, in David's life, you'll see that he really is. Uh, he, was, he was vulnerable. He was someone who had weaknesses. He was someone that was in need of God, and he recognized it. That's why I think he was called a man after God's own heart, is because he didn't, he, you know, when he, remember when he went up against Goliath? What did he say? Did he say, well, I'll beat that guy? He said, well, I'll be the one to do it. 
No, he said, who is this guy? Who is this man that, that, that speaks against the, 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 the God of Israel? You know, who is this guy? You know, he, it wasn't his own power. He knew very well where his power came from. It came from God. And that is the attitude that we need to have here. It has the sheep and the shepherd metaphor. Um, he said, this day, all will know there is a God in Israel. In Israel. Yes, that's exactly right. Not that there is a powerful warrior. No. No. Um, and and there's, so there's a lot wrapped up in the sheep. It does take some humility. It takes some humility to say that. Um, sheep are, you know, it, it, are, are in need of guidance. They're in need of protection. They're in need of sustenance. They are, they are um, apparently they thought that it was worth it because people kept sheep and still do today. We're talking about domestic sheep here, okay? We're not talking about mountain sheep or anything like that. We're talking about domestic sheep. Um, there are other Bible verses that speak of this idea of dependence on God. If there's ever a picture of dependence on someone, sheep are dependent on what? Shepherd. 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 That's exactly right. They are greatly dependent on the shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are, are pretty much, yeah, you say they're lost. They're, they're pretty much dead for the most part uh, without a shepherd. They, they are not, you don't go find domestic sheep just wandering around in the wild somewhere, you know, like you will colts or some other kind of animals. You don't see that. Um, so there are other metaphors. Jesus, uh, in the very first beatitude, what did he say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Same idea. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, most of us are not, you know, most of us are not shepherds and probably never have been. But I would bet you that there's a relationship that most of us have experienced. Matter of fact, I would dare say all of us that's similar to shepherd and sheep. See if anyone can get it. There you go. You got it. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Right answer. Parent and child. That's exactly right. And the parent, ch children uh, are very dependent, aren't they? You know, if you, you, you leave a, a baby alone, it's going to die. It's not going to live. You have to take care of it. Um, and Jesus knew this. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Around verse, we'll start in verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. That's a powerful statement. If you don't enter the kingdom like a little child, you will never enter it. Why would he say that? I'm going to throw this out. Why would he say that? There's no, no room for us to say, I am so great, I am so good, I am so powerful. Yeah. No. No, there's no room for that. No. There's no room for us saying, well, this, you know, I bring half to the table and God brings the other half. You know, that, there's no room for that. You or, are what you are because God has blessed you. Yes. Or the other side of that is you've learned so much that I, I know it all. So now I'm ready to accept what God has to give me. You know, you, you can't know enough. You, you have to come as a child, not knowing pretty much anything, just the basics. Yeah. Be accepted. Yeah. If, if anything, children are humble. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, children are humble. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, that, that we have to come to God under those terms. And if we don't, you know, recognizing those things. And, and, and like I said, there's different, different uh, metaphors that talk about that, but it's all through the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. We do not come to God on our own terms because we have, we have, we are not able to. We're not able to come to God. And if, 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 suppose a sheep says to himself, and I guess sometimes they do because there are wayward sheep, you know, sometimes they want it, they, I'm just fine. 
I'm, I'm a good, you know, I'll handle, I can handle anything and just starts heading on out into the woods, you know, and head out into the forest or the wilderness or whatever. What happens to that sheep? Gets eaten up by a lion or a wolf or something, you know. That's what happens to that sheep. You know, Troy, there's uh, there are children's books that are so absolutely profound. Mm -hmm. And most people think, oh, that's just a child's book. But there was one that was written a long, long time. Um, and I can't say her name right off. The woman wrote it. It was called Mr. the Lamb. And I've never heard of it. It was a little lamb mm -hmm. that bad at everything. Mm -hmm. He hated the shepherd. He hated anybody that said, you can't do this, you must do that. So he ran away. Okay. And he was on his own. Oh, it's so wonderful to be free. And he fell into a crevice. And he could not get out. He was foot was caught. And he heard a voice as it was beginning to get dark. And then he heard the shepherd's voice. The shepherd had gone out to find him. And he cried, Master. <laughs> and the master swooped him up and put him under his coat, took him back to the sheepfold. Uh -huh. It was a different little lamb then. But yeah. she had called him Blister the Lamb. Blister. We've got a whole lot of blisters. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And sometimes we ourselves are blister. Oh, and we're gonna get to that. That's the next that's my next point. Um, okay, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. Is this the way we always feel? Now, be honest. I'm, I'm calling on everyone to be honest here, okay? I want you to be honest. This, this is not a, it doesn't do us any good to look at our life and look at the Bible and not be honest with ourselves, okay? The, the, I, I can answer the question for you, but I'm just going to let someone else say it. You know, do we always feel this way? No. No, no. no we don't, okay? Um, and I mean, that's, that's not good. That's something, you know, that, that's why this, this verse and specifically the whole Psalm really, but spe specifically this verse and in general, the whole Psalm is a model for us. It is an example for us to strive toward just like those song, you know, we sing, I surrender all, but you know, and I sing that with the thought of this, you know, that's something for me to strive toward. That's how I sing that song. He leadeth me. That's something for me. That's how that direction I want to go. Well, this is the direction we want to go, okay? We may not live up to it all the time, but that's what we want to be. This is the kind of thinking we need to have. The Lord is my shepherd, okay? That's the kind of thinking we need to have. And furthermore, he says, I shall not be in want or I lack nothing. Um, Troy. Yes. I'm sorry, someone raise your hand. Go ahead, brother. I did really. Actually, uh, I think you know that that's a true statement. We don't really all always do the. No, we don't. And what we should look at is if David had times that he veered away from it, as well as things that we veered. But we got to come back like David. Yeah. David always. Yes, and that's what. Go ahead. Love God. Yes. Absolutely. And that's in this psalm as well. We're going to get to it. It's kind of hiding in one of the ends of one of the verses, but we're going to get to it. Um, how do we know the times in our life when we don't feel this way? It may not come to our heads. We don't consciously say, hmm, I'm not feeling much like a sheep right now. You know, we don't say that. Well, what is the indicators in our life, what are the flags that come up and say, you're not, you're not feeling like a shepherd and sheep. You're not feeling like God's your shepherd right now. You're not feeling much like a sheep. What are the indicators of that? How does it rear its head in our lives? I'm going to sit here until somebody says something. <laughs> angry with someone, if somebody has done something to us and we feel kind of like we want to get Want some revenge? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, that's one way. It's like, wait a second. I need to. What does it say about revenge in the Bible? 
It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's not ours, right? Vengeance is 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 is, uh, is God's. Okay. And so we think, well, God's not sufficient to take care of this problem. I got to step in and do it. And so that's one way. There's all. There's no one right answer to this question, but there are answers to the question. Okay. So when we see something like that, we think, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in need of, of, uh, of my own justice here. Okay. God's not sufficient to take care of it. Um, and that's what we say. So that's, that's an example. What else? Anybody? Yes. I think that a lot of times when we start just feeling like our life is not going correctly and our, you know, we're not as daily things start, you know, bothering us more. I think that that's when we need to get back to God's word and, and his body. A worry. Okay. That's a, that's a red flag. We start worrying. We, do, do you see, as we read this, this Psalm, do you see worry coming out? Is this person worried? No, this person's not worried. J David's not worried as he writes this. The, the, the heart of the Psalm is the exact opposite. It's complete faith, trust, and peace. Do you see peace in here? I see just, it's just flowing out. It's peace. Not worry. Okay, so worry is a red flag. Okay. Um, <clears throat> go ahead, brother. About when you think everything is going great, though, the opposite of that. I mean, we get so complacent in, oh, my life is perfect, that it raises that red flag as well. We still need that shepherd. And, and, and that raises pride sometimes. The, the Israelites had that. It happened oftentimes when good times were, were going on, they would think, they would forget about God. And uh, pride is an example of it. Uh, the, the sub question to this is how does it show itself? It shows itself through um, revenge. It shows itself through worry. It shows itself through pride. How about just sin in general? Sin in general. We think I'm going to, you know, there's something there that God hasn't given me that's good. And I'm going to go out and take it. Where, where did that first happen? Something good that God hasn't let, done let me have, but I'm going to go out and so I'm going to go out and take it. Where did that first happen? The Garden of Eden. That's exactly where that happened. You know, this this fruit's good for you know. God's holding this back from you. Don't you don't you need to go out and take it? And that's exactly what they did. Saul, when he was king, and he couldn't wait on God, so he went ahead and took it in his own hands. Uh huh. And God said. Wait. <laughs> yeah. God says, God says, wait. And we say, nope, nope. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to do it now. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to wait. That's what, that's what the, the, the red flag is that says, you know, I'm not going to say the Lord is my shepherd. That's exactly what we're saying when we do those things. And that's why I know when, when I ask the question, do we always say the Lord is my shepherd? Can we always say that? And truthfully, no, we can't. That's what we need to strive for. Um, we try to get fulfillment in some other way besides God. We try to get fulfillment in some other way besides his way of doing things. Um, the... Uh, <clears throat> So now here's a related question. Let's throw this out. Now think about this. And, and we, we sort of answered some of it, but uh, let's just see if there's any more here. What causes us to think this way? What causes us to think that God is not sufficient? His way is not sufficient. He's holding back on me. I'm going to go out and get, do things my way, and I'm going to... Get all, go for the gusto, you know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going for the gusto, as the beer commercial would say. So what causes us to, what gets in there? What kind of thinking? What, 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 what causes this to happen? I think it's our arrogant ways. Uh, we, we always think we can do it ourselves. We don't need Jesus. And Pride and arrogance, yes. Okay. All right. Now, remember... You might say, well, that's not me. Well, I, I have faith. I'm, I'm a faith. I have, I'm a person of faith. I have faith. I'm, not arrogant. I'm not that way. But remember, faith is not what you think. It's what you, what you do. Faith is what you do. 
you know, so uh, we, need, we need to be careful about what we say on this because what we say, you know, the faith is the part of what we think is that, that makes us do something. And if we do it, that's what we're thinking. Okay. So let's be careful there. Good point. All right. What else? What, what causes us to, to, to think, to not feel like we, uh, you know, the Lord is our shepherd. What causes us? Go ahead. And then you think that God is moving too slow. So we feel that. Oh, yes. God's moving. It's not. Yeah, I'm expecting this to happen, and it ain't happening in my time. You know, God's moving too slow. And um, so, yeah, that's another That's another way. Um, over here. Oh, <laughs> um, sometimes we, and we don't even realize how influenced we are being by the media, oh. Uh, oh, television, yeah. newspapers how those people seemingly have worked things out, you know, um, uh, the way, the perfect way it should be. Yeah, uh, and it's just assumed that it's this way. Before we even realize it, yeah. you know, we've, we've taken that in uh -huh. to our, our way of living. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and when something comes up that rocks the, our boat, we don't Go to God. stop yeah. and you know, see and pray and see how God is going to help us work it out. The culture is powerful. Culture that we live in. You know, that's why meetings like this are so important. That's why it's so important for us to be in the scriptures. And that was my next point. What causes us to think this way is not spending time with God. You know, I get the idea that the person that wrote this song, I get the idea that David... He, and I say the person that wrote the song because <clears throat> I'm including hopefully anybody who can say these words. That's my point. Us, hopefully. But the person that can say these words is someone who has spent time with God, isn't it? And if you can say them right now, then you have, you have been spending time with God. Um, David didn't just perk up with a moment of faith and say, I can kill Goliath. No. He had spent time with God and he knew he could because he knew that God would do it through him. He knew it was going to happen. It was as if it had already happened. And, and you know, that's kind of how if we stay away from God, then we're going to not, are we, we going to be thinking like this? If we stay away from his word, if we stay away from Christian people, if we stay away from uh, the church, if we stay, if we, if we move away from those or it's just a once in a while kind of thing, do we think we're going to be thinking like this? No, we're not going to be thinking like this. And because we wouldn't be thinking like this, we wouldn't have the blessing of this. Now let's get into the blessing of it. Okay. It says here, he leads me beside quiet water. He, wait, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. Now, I, I thought, just like the sister over here said, I thought the very first quiet waters and green pastures were the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was the first quiet waters and green pastures, and, and the, Adam and Eve messed it up. They messed it up. And so, but you know what? Look what it says in the next verse, beginning of the next line. It says, he restores my soul. Now, I think we've answered the question, but I'm just going to throw it out there anyway. Why does our soul need to be restored? Why does anybody's soul need to be restored? Because we're out of relationship with God. Exactly. That's why it needs to be restored because we're out of a relationship with God. We're out. We don't, we weren't thinking like that at the beginning. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. We're thinking some other way. That's why our soul needs to be restored. And so, yeah, it's, it's there. Um, Questions like that. When we read through Psalms, we need to ask those questions. I mean, does my soul need to be? Do I need to repent? Do I need to go back to God? Those are the questions that the Psalms asks us if we will just kind of think about it. Um, now, I want us to keep in mind something else. <clears throat> Green pastures and quiet waters. Um, those are not necessarily, quote, luxury items. That's not necessarily a mansion or a Mercedes Benz, okay? Those are what sheep like. And if we're going to be sheep, we're going to have to be content with God. 
And if we are content with God, then he, we, we, we will understand more and more that that is all we need is him. We don't have to have what the world says you need to have. The world says you need to have, you know, all kinds of things and, and tries to motivate us, you know, uh, to have the, the quote finer things of life. You know, and I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with the finer things of life, but I am saying that if that's what we are aiming for, the finer things of life will greatly disappoint us. They will. Oh, yeah. They will greatly disappoint us. They will not fulfill us. And, and, and then we, we, people will just be, we will just be searching for more and more of it, is what we'll find. It's, it's just going to be an empty hole. Okay. Um, but green pastures and quiet waters, that's what a sheep wants. And that's what we need to, to understand. And that's God himself. We need God more than the air we breathe. That's the kind of thinking we need to have. We need God more than the air we breathe. And Troy, that, that applies to the richest, most powerful person on this earth. Oh, yeah. Whoever that is. And when it says, blessed are the meek and poor and spirit, mm -hmm. not in the things of this world. No, in spirit. And in spirit. And that applies to the most powerful person. Everyone. Or the poorest person. Or the poorest. Doesn't matter. Everybody. Yeah. And then it says he restores my soul. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. Yeah. He does that because he loves us. He's the one to go to. Now, oftentimes, some, sometimes people get low in their spirit. That's why there's so much depression and anxiety out there. People get realize that there's something wrong in my life. So they go to a psychiatrist. They realize there's something wrong in my life, so they try to go to the self-help book on the in the in the books a million or Barnes and Noble. You know, they they look for something beyond to fix this problem in their life. He restores our soul. God is the one that does that. Unfortunately, people are going to all the wrong places. Doctor Phil and Oprah are not going to do it. You know, it's not going to happen. They're not going to be the answer to our problems. Um, ultimately, it is God who restores our soul. And if we're going to, if we were low in spirit, if we are downcast, if we are in the dumps, so to speak, who restores our soul? God restores our soul. That's who we need to go to. Unfortunately, so many people are going other places to fill, try to fill that hole in our heart. And there's no other, it's trying to like, you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It's not going to happen. And it's not going to work. God's the only one that will do that. Um, okay. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness um, for his name's sake. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Um, you know, when we go against this, when we go against his guidance, we just hurt ourselves. We're just hurting ourselves. It's like that sheep blister, okay, who just went away and ended up almost getting killed. All right, we we will uh, we will hurt ourselves. Um, you know, so often I've heard, seen people. Uh, you've heard of it before. Husband leaves his wife for a younger woman, and divorces his wife and goes for the younger woman. What what usually happens with that relationship? It falls apart. It doesn't work. The grass is not greener on the other side because it's not a problem with the, the wife. It's a problem with the person, with the man. It's a problem. And it goes both ways, by the way. It's not just husband and wives do that, too. You know, it's a, it's a problem within us. Um, hey, Troy. Go ahead. I, I, had a, uh, uh, I had a video pop up through one of my feeds the other day. And it just... Uh, preacher was talking about something along sheep and this guy's shepherd he's watching his sheep and this one goes wandering off the side well somebody had been digging a ditch beside the road mm -hmm. i mean a big deep for pipes or whatever and this sheep just walked right into it fell right down in it couldn't get out couldn't move it was just barely big enough to squeeze the sheep down in there so the guy goes over and picks up the sheep pulls it out of the ditch sets it on the side that he should stay on to keep going with the rest of the sheep the sheep just goes right back over and jumps right back in the ditch. 
pulls it out, sets it on the opposite side, thinking, well, he's probably going to go that direction, the other direction. Sheep comes right back over, jumps right back in the ditch. And the whole premise was stay with the shepherd so that he's guiding you in the right path. But then again, we try to do it all ourselves. And like, okay, I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to put myself back in the ditch. <laughs> and God's still trying to reach down there and help us. And, and that. we think how ludicrous that is, but yeah. how often do we see people do that? Right. Yeah. We see people do that and we think, you know, it's like insanity. But no, but he, the Lord guides us in our relationships, how we conduct ourselves with each other. If we allow him to do so, he will allow us to do that. In that way, when someone does us harm, we can realize, hmm, they did Jesus harm. And how did he respond? You know, he didn't go after vengeance. He said, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. How often have we said that? Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We said that? No. Oh, Lord, zap them for me. <laughs> Remember the, 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 the uh, disciples when, when the Samaritans were treating them badly? Yeah. Lord, bring, shall we call down fire from heaven and kill them? You know, and Jesus is like, what? <laughs> Don't you realize I died for these? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, no, it's, uh, the, but we have to allow God to guide us in our relationships. Okay, what does God want me to do? Uh, in our relation, you know, and, and, and not just relationships with, with, within every part of our lives. He says he, he, um, he guides me in paths of righteousness. What kills me is when someone tells me, oh, the Lord led me to do this. When the this is something shouldn't be doing. Shouldn't be doing. I'm like, no, the Lord did not lead you to do that. No matter what perversion we have caught up in, thank God made me this way. No, he didn't. Yeah, no, no, the, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the Lord didn't lead you to do that. No. If it's something wrong, the Lord didn't lead you to do that. You let yourself there. Okay. You know, that's why I believe that the scripture saying in this, this verse, this uh, passage, this Psalm doesn't go into it. Other Psalms do. It goes into how we should delight ourselves in the Lord. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, then we're not drug off to other sinful lusts and desires. Okay, uh, we do things the right way. Um, and so, anyway, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. What is the valley of the shadow of death? Now, this is not a rhetorical question. I would like an answer to this. What is the valley of the shadow of death? Okay. All right, sin. Uh, I think sin can lead us there, certainly. Um, what is the, go ahead. I, I heard uh, Ray Vanderlaan speak of this, and in uh, the area around Jerusalem, there was the Kidron Valley and a lot of uh, death and destruction and things, the trash were all burned up out there. And that's kind of the path that you had to go through to get to Jerusalem when you're coming from two different directions, you have to end up going through that. And that's what he's referring to. But it also meant all the other things were, that you think of. Sin, things that separate us from God, those times when we're really low and we're, we're depressed or we're uh, downtrodden because somebody else is hurting us or doing something to, to offend us or whatever. If you look in your footnote or your Bible, most of them will have, it will say, or through the darkest valley through the darkest valley. And so I think it can be death itself, or it can be things leading up to it. It can be crisis. It can be pain. It can be any of these things. Life. Life, life, yeah, life leads us there, right? And if it hasn't hit you, the, you haven't gone through the valley yet, just wait. You will. It's coming. The question is, how will you handle it? Well, if, you have, if you're with God, it goes a whole lot different than otherwise. Because this person, look what this person says. What's the next verse? I will fear no, evil. fear no evil. I don't have to be afraid of the dark valley. I don't have to be afraid of it. Because, and it says why. For you are with me. For you are with me. Isn't that a beautiful thought? That is a beautiful thought. But if we don't spend time with God, then we won't feel like he's with us. 
We won't have that confidence. That's the whole idea is to have that confidence that I'm with God and he's with me. And that's the thing we should all search for and strive for, to have that confidence. No matter what happens to us in this life, we're going to walk with God. We're going to be with him for eternity. Yes. He's confident. Okay. It, it is that confidence. And, and, you know, that's the blessing of, of being able to say the Lord is my shepherd, isn't it? When we have that thought and we have that confidence that he is my shepherd and it's, we, we make it a reality in our lives, he gives us the choice. He gives us the choice. It's there. Then we can have this blessing. I will fear no evil for you are with me. All right. Now I'm going to throw, we have about five more minutes. Uh, that was the first bell. <clears throat> so I'm going to throw this out and let's see what we can do with it. We have to think about this now. How does God lead us? How does God lead us? Let's think about it. Yes. I think Jesus would have answered you this way when they asked him, how do we approach God? And he gave them the, this is how you pray. To God. And in that section of the Bible, in the Jesus, when you come up, you pray to God for your guidance. Okay. What did he say? I, I know y'all know the, know the, know the the prayer itself, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. But I, I think I see your point. God leads us when we pray. Yeah, I, I think that's true. He wants you to seek him. Uh-huh. That's what it is. Yeah. Seek him. Um, or he'll get it to you. To him who seeks... So, I mean, to him who not so ask and it will be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. Forever asks, receives, and who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Yes, that's exactly right. Very good. It's going to take some seeking on our part. Um, and, and that's an excellent answer. How does God lead us? Well, we seek him. And then as we seek him, he leads us. How else does he? What else we want to add to that? He leads us by uh, getting into his words, studying his words, okay. the Bible, uh, being patient, uh, understanding the power of God. Yes. You know, the word may not tell us every answer. It may not say, yes, Bill, you need to take this job over here. It may not say that, but it gives us principles to, to go by. It gives us principles to live our lives by. That if, if we understand, the more we understand it, the more we understand the principles, the more we can apply them to our lives to go where we're going. You know, maybe a principle in my life says that I, I don't want to spend my life with someone that doesn't believe in God. You know, so I'm going to marry someone who's a Christian. You know, that, that's a principle that we can apply from the Word. Okay, that's just a basic thing. Um, or you can, there are other things, you know. Maybe a principle is, well, I got this job offer, but they want me to do this, this, and this, and I don't agree with these things. Maybe I shouldn't take that. Ding, 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 right answer, okay? Because we're applying principles, even though the Bible doesn't say, you know, take job A, not job B, you know, or whatever. Um, you see my point. But if you're not in the word, you don't understand the principles and you can't apply them. How else does God lead us? Uh, by by uh, uh, sending people into our lives uh, of all ages yes. who are good Christian examples, and we can learn from them. Sometimes and even children yes. will, will, will uh, sh reveal the will of God to us on occasion. Mm -hmm. you know, Lita has always uh, talked about the cradle roll, where these kids can't even speak, really, and she starts with them. Uh -huh. But she teaches them to love the Bible. Uh -huh. And they sing those little songs. Yeah. And then later when Betty would get them up from Rita's class, uh -huh. they were preachers. <laughs> little, they were little preachers, yes. yes. Mom and dad must, could just absolutely be clueless. But those kids preach sermons to them all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's, there you go. Uh, other people, God sends other people into our lives if we will just listen. Now, here's the thing. I, I think of that old song, that old gospel, uh, Southern gospel song, Turn Your Radio On. You know, you ever heard that song, Turn Your Radio On? It's not talking about the car radio, okay? It's, it's talking about in your head you need to be tuned 
to the voice of God. Yes. You need to be tuned to be listening for God to speak to you. Um, there's a passage, and we're not going to get to finish this, but we'll, we'll finish it next week. But there's a passage uh, in Romans chapter 12 that says, you know, as we, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. It's the very few first few verses of chapter 12 of Romans. It says, as we transform our minds, we're able to test and prove the will of God. You know, so as we submit our hearts and will to God, you think that to understand and be able to have the leading of God is a privilege. It's a privilege. Absolutely. It's not just, we should not take that for granted. No. It only occurs when we are willing to accept it. Why should God try it? Why should God lead us when we're not, we're not accepting the leading? And we shouldn't expect that if we weren't. We, and another thing, we shouldn't say, well, Lord, show me your will and I'll decide whether I'll accept it or not. As if we're going to do it on our own terms. That's not how it works. That's dangerous ground. Yeah. You know, as if, you know, we're telling God what to do. You know, you show me what you want me to do, then I'll decide whether. No, that may be how we deal with business matters. That's not how we deal with God. With God, we say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you have for me. Show me what it is. And then you might get, you need to look because you'll see something. God will show you. But it has to do with the condition of your heart. And like with Jesus' ministry, so many times people would say, Lord, send, uh, show me a miracle. Yeah, show us a sign. And he said, what do you need? I've fed the hungry. I've raised the dead. I've walked on water. He on the blind. <laughs> hey, where have you been? Are you listening? Well, that's why he said a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. You know, I mean, it's like we. So anyway. Um, and Troy. Yes. What helps me out every day is I listen to Christian music. I listen to Caleb. Uh, okay. Nine, and that helps me. Out okay. All right. I do, too. I, I do, too. I listen to that as well. Uh, Christian music. And Troy, that was the last meal. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close out. Let's, uh, let's have a quick prayer. Lord, we, we thank you for this psalm. We pray that it would be a challenge to us, Father, to look at our own lives and see if we can say these same words with the conviction of the psalmist. Lord, we, we thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for your participation today.